We'll be looking at John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11 today. And the title of the message is The Trap or Caught But Not Condemned. Caught But Not Condemned. Have you ever had trouble with mice in your house? <clears throat> when we were in North Carolina, we had a lot of trouble with mice. The parsonage just seemed to be a magnet for them. And one year, we had a very dry spring, and consequently, more mice than usual. And we really noticed them. Of course, Clarice noticed them first. And uh, she's the one that woke me up and kept me awake, uh, worrying about the mice. And uh, there at night, they were scampering up around in the, in the attic. And so the next day, I became a great white hunter. And I began setting traps. And I did really good. I was catching three or four mice a day. <clears throat> For a while, that is. And then all of a sudden, I wasn't catching very many. About the only thing I was catching was my own fingers because I'd try to check the traps and, and there was nothing there but because the bait wasn't even there. They had gotten so smart they'd snatched the bait and didn't set the trap off. They left it for my finger to do it. They, uh, but those furry little creatures were pretty careful. You know, sometimes trapping can be very, very difficult. Back in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were trappers. And they found out how difficult trapping could be. At least they were trappers who tried trapping Jesus. They tried trapping him. They tried to trap him and catch him because they're they wanted to destroy Christ. It's an amazing thing. Righteous people find that other people want to destroy them for no reason at all. Jesus was doing good, healing people, doing miracles, and they wanted to destroy him. Let's read a little bit about uh, the trapping. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, 
Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, you know, we don't know how they found what they thought was the perfect bait for their trap. But they found this woman. They caught her in the act of adultery. And they brought the woman before Jesus. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? On the surface, the answer seems simple, doesn't it? Well... If that's what the law of Moses says, then go stone her. There was just one problem with that. Judea was under Roman law with a Roman governor. And no one had the right to execute anyone except the Romans. John 18.31 if Jesus told them to stone her, he would have been breaking the Roman law. If he told them to let her go, he would have been guilty of breaking the Mosaic law. So they thought they had him in a dilemma, trapped with no way out. It's plain that these men were just using the woman as bait. They could care less about the woman. They could care less about the fact of whether or not she was caught in the act of adultery. They didn't even care about the man. They didn't take him. In Leviticus it says that both the man and the woman are supposed to be stoned to death. But they didn't bother bringing the man, just the woman. And the poor woman was standing up there as one of the dregs of society. She was scorned and scared and humiliated. And she stood there helplessly while one man was forced to decide whether she lived or died. Her sin was paraded by the Jews in front of Jesus and in front of the crowd that was there listening to him teach. She probably had no idea why these men brought her to be judged by Jesus. The woman was bait. A little fish, you ever know when you go fishing, you take and you put a minnow on the end of the pole and you use a small fish to catch the big fish? Well, that's what they were doing. They were, she was just a little fish and they were using that to catch the big fish, Jesus. But it failed. They didn't catch Jesus. Jesus was their prey, not the woman. It was Jesus that they really wanted to put to death. They didn't want to put the, the woman to death. They could care less. But they did want to put Jesus to death. 
if they were really seriously zealous for that law, they would have found the man and they would have done what Leviticus 20.10 says. Both of them would have been put to death. Jesus knew them and he knew the law But you know, he didn't even bring that up. He didn't argue with them about that. Because he knew that their only interest was not in justice. It was not in the truth. Their only interest was in trying to kill him. He knew their hearts. So he knew it was useless to argue over technical points or even over real points. It's kind of funny. He wasn't going to stoop to their level. So he stooped to write in, this, in the dirt. The hunters thought that they had trapped him at last but he didn't take the bait. And instead of them trapping him, they became the ones who were entrapped. <coughs> and that's the second important part. They had asked the question, what do you say? What is your judgment? And in this case, Jesus' lack of verbal response must have really infuriated them. All he did was bend down and do some writing in the dirt. And they kept pressing him for an answer. And he didn't answer right away. And they kept on pressing him. Why wouldn't he answer? Why wouldn't he answer? And finally, finally they, they got an answer out of him. Finally, he stood up. Finally, he opened his mouth. And they were all ready and set to pounce on him. They were ready to discredit him. When he stood up, every ear was tuned in. And every mouth was ready to speak. However, something happened. He didn't answer the way they expected. The trap was sprung, but it didn't catch him. It caught them. They were ensnared by their own trap. He put them on the spot. He said, if any of you is without sin, let him begin stoning her. <coughs> then he calmly bent over and began to write again. They were in shock. They had no rebuttal. They were silenced at last. And they began to drift away, one at a time, from the oldest to the youngest. Apparently, the youngest found it a little bit harder to give up and accept defeat. But they went away like whipped pups with their tails between their legs. The trappers became the trapped. In their leaving, they left the woman behind with Jesus. The question was still there to be answered. What was to be done with the woman? The crowd Jesus was talking <coughs> Who was still there. In other words, the people were there that Jesus had been teaching and preaching to. And the interrupters, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they had gone. And so now the only ones left were those who were really interested in listening to what Jesus had to say. And it was those 
who were there. Um, and so the woman stood there just confused and afraid. She didn't try to run. She didn't try to escape. She was still guilty of sin. And Jesus hadn't really given a verdict yet. All he had done was remove the right of condemnation from the accusers. He took the right away from them to, to condemn her. That's all. She stood there waiting and waiting. Time had probably stood still for her. And she was filled with turmoil. Finally, he stood up and spoke to her. For the first time, he spoke to her. And he said, and catch the first word that he says. He said, woman. Who did else did he say that to? He used that same word when he talked to his mother. Woman. When he did the miracle at Cana of Galilee. Woman. And he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? And uh, has no one condemned you? And she replied, no one, sir. No one. Then came the most gracious words ever spoken. He said, then neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Now these words were resounding with grace and mercy and forgiveness. The law was clear. She deserved death. That day, justice was not served on this woman, but grace was. John 3.17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And this passage is an indication of that very fact. Jesus' death on the cross proves the same thing. To our way of thinking, justice was not served on the cross. Jesus was not guilty. He was innocent. No, justice was not served, but grace was the guilty died for the innocent. The guilty has died for the innocent. Or excuse me. The innocent has died for the guilty. Got it backwards. Jesus, the innocent Son of God, died for the guilty. Why? So that he can shower grace upon those who are guilty. We're all just as guilty as those who walked away. Those who accused the woman. We're just as guilty as they are. And we're just as guilty as the woman was. Oh, our sins may not be the same, but we're not without sin. That day the woman was set free. The guilty received grace. The lesson's there for us. As Christians, we're messengers of grace, not hangmen ready to condemn. That doesn't mean we don't warn people about the condemnation to come because condemnation is coming, but it's not for us to do. 
We're called to warn people to escape the condemnation to come by accepting the gracious offer of God's grace that comes through Jesus Christ. That day, the woman was freed. She was freed. But there is one more statement made by Jesus that we can't ignore, and it was a warning. And the warning is to live like people who have been freed from sin. Jesus told her, go now and live your life and leave your life of sin. Jesus doesn't save us so that we can continue doing what we're doing. He saves us so that we can live without sin. He saves us from sin, to leave sin. No, he doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect. But it does mean that we're going to live a, a pure and a clean life because we've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We'll have our sins washed away. We rise up out of the uh, watery grave of baptism and we rise as a new person in Christ and we, uh, we're no longer the same. We need to remember what Peter preached. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And that's the great news, the good message, the good news. <laughs> We shall live with Christ and reign with him forever and ever. And that's the offer of salvation. Will you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Will you be, will you be washed in the watery grave and rise in a newness of life? And live for Christ. Will you do that? We're going to invite you to come forward as we sing our invitation hymn.
thank you for your great love toward us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sin. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you that he died for us. We thank you for the cross. Lord, help us to realize that that's not a small thing. that that's the greatest act that's ever happened in the history of mankind. Help us always to take that seriously. And help us to live for you. Dismiss us now with your mercy and grace. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.